Hi, thanks for having me. I'm going to talk about a new way of fighting disease. If you think about how human civilization has controlled disease for centuries, it's actually basically about the same way. Before you have any pharmaceutical interventions available, effectively, all that happens is that you try to find out who's sick. And then you find out who they've been around. Sort of like their contacts, I guess. That's what this is usually called. So you find out who they've been around. And then you try to remove all of them from society against their will. That against their will part is the difficulty. If you have a math professor come to give a talk, you <laughs> end up getting a chalk talk like this. Well, sort of, for part of it. But the, the point is, whenever you have this kind of a situation going on where things are happening against people's will, then unfortunately it becomes quite difficult to control the disease. Because, for example, some of these people might not cooperate, even though they were around a sick person. Being removed from society to protect everyone else in society against them is not necessarily what they want to do. What we thought about was that you can actually change the way that you intervene in a pandemic now that we have smartphones, now that we have the ability to, cr to create networks. In fact, using idea quite similar to what's behind LinkedIn, except that we use the physical network instead of who people are connected to on LinkedIn. The idea is actually very simple. Instead of only trying to remove those people from society when they have already been around the person who's sick, you think about the fact that there's actually a, a network going on of different people who are spending time around different people. The network could be complicated. But then somewhere, there's you. And the concept was, if you could collect this network anonymously and automatically, where each of these edges Here's an edge where each of these edges means that those two people spend lots of time around each other. And this is why it's different from how LinkedIn works. But this, this is what we could do with an app, for example. If you make an app for which when people are around each other, you figure out that these people anonymously were around each other for an extended period of time, then you can suddenly do a very different kind of intervention you could actually tell each person how far away the disease is in terms of the number of relationships, sort of like LinkedIn's degree of connection. For example, here, you are one, two, three, four relationships away from the person who is sick. So this opens the possibility of suddenly trying to quantify the distance that you are from a disease in terms of the number of physical relationships. Well, what use could that be? It turns out that that actually is quite useful because that opens the door to allowing you to display the information on something that looks like this. And here you see that this is showing how things are changing over time. And this is actually showing how the disease is spreading relative to you. So if you look at this, this the height of the bar is how many cases of the disease there are. And the degree of the connection is actually what we just saw in the previous picture. Here, the closest thing is at the fourth degree. That, that's the closest disease. That would correspond to a situation like this, where that disease is four physical relationships away from you. Well, what good is this? Well, it turns out that if you look at it this way, suddenly the intervention is doing something very different for the app user. Remember, the previous interventions were about telling people that they need to be removed from society against their will. Now suddenly this thing is telling you, the app user, not that you have to be removed from society because you are dangerous to other people, but that you suddenly have the chance to defend yourself. This is telling you before you're a threat to other people, but telling you that something's on its way. And in that sense, this inspires actually selfish behavior, selfish behavior of trying not to get sick. And that provides another way of achieving the original goal. You see, the original goal was to find a way to separate the people who are potentially sick from the people who are healthy. And this method provides a way still to do that separation, but one where instead of trying to get these people to stay away from everyone else, to protect everyone else from them, this inspires those people to take particular actions that selfishly help them avoid getting sick. And there are two ways to separate two sets, A and B. You don't just have to move A away. Our idea was to move B away. 
Okay, so that's the, that's the big idea. But now let's go in and start talking about how some of this actually works and comes together. And I wanted to open with this larger idea because that shows that by just changing the perspective to use the whole network, instead of just telling people after they've been directly around somebody else, this unlocks a possibility to even use game theory to incentivize people to do what selfishly they would like to do that also controls disease. For that, that is then our concept of this personal pandemic radar. And this is actually an app that is it's, it's not even just a theoretical thing. We've actually built this and we've put it out into the world to go and see how it works. And this is the app that's actually called Novid. Now, the way that this works is that it's based entirely on trying to modify people's behavior. And as we just saw, I was showing some videos of these particular charts moving around. But the basic concept is that you'd be able to see as a person, how the disease is evolving towards you. And ideally, where you'd find out before it got to degree one. And if you want to compare this with how people have been handling contact tracing apps, for example, a contact tracing app is something where you wouldn't see most of this information or most of this information. You'd only see information of what was already at degree one when it was already too late for you to avoid getting sick from that person. The whole point of the app was to tell that you might already have gotten sick to do something. Now, if you're able to find out in advance when, when it's somehow that the disease is somewhere getting close to you, then there are actually a variety of things that you can do. For example, you know, if you found out that something is within three physical relationships of you, you could decide to wear a better mask. And actually, this could even provide an end game for the pandemic. Many people don't want to wear masks forever. And the entire point is, well, we can stop wearing masks when we don't have a danger. But if you have to just say, tell everyone, wear masks, wear masks until there's really no danger at all, that might be a very long time. On the other hand, this would give you a way to dynamically, if you could find out how far away disease was, you could even dynamically decide, you could dynamically decide when to start wearing a mask again during this end game. And there are other things you can do too, like increasing distancing. Uh, if you found out that there was disease coming towards you, then you might actually be so incentivized to try to stay away. Actually, about un avoiding unnecessary social gatherings, about these kinds of behaviors, the reason why we are so excited about creating this kind of technology is because not only of what it could do for COVID, but what it could do for the next pandemic as well. Because for example, if you imagine there was something like Ebola coming, uh, if, if that started to spread through the air, that would be disastrous. And nobody wants to get Ebola. And fortunately, fortunately, that drives an automatic mechanism by which people might actually want to avoid getting sick. They might actually want to participate in this system because there's actually an incentive here. The incentive to participate in this system is not just to be a good person. It's not just to protect other people from you. It's to yourself avoid getting infected and avoid getting quarantined. And that's the game theory. You see, because if you think about the behavioral science aspect, uh, there's a notion of a Nash equilibrium. A Nash equilibrium is a system of behaviors by which if everybody has that behavior, no single person has the incentive to change their behavior selfishly, and you would need a coordinated effort to move out of that. And the reason why the Nash equilibrium provides an interesting perspective is that actually when you install an app like this, the act of installing an app like what we have just described, is different from every other app in the world. It actually reduces your chance of getting infected. It even reduces your chance of getting quarantined, if you think about it, because you could use it to avoid being too close to other people whenever you saw the disease coming. And the quarantine measures usually are that if you spent a significant amount of time around the sick person, then you'd get quarantined. But this way you could know just to avoid that option in the first place. But the important thing is that actually this world of contact tracing apps those are what were there before us. The contact tracing apps are apps that will tell you after you've already been around somebody who is positive. Actually, those increase the user's chance of quarantine because that's the main delivery of the app, but they only reduce everyone else's chance of infection. And then at that point, the Nash equilibria are quite interesting because, for example, with the other systems, one might wonder why the other systems didn't take off. And one reason could just be that well, unfortunately, for a selfish person, a contact tracing app doesn't do that much for them. And therefore, actually, the only Nash equilibrium, if you think about selfish people, is where nobody has the app installed. Because, for example, if everybody had the other app installed, you actually wouldn't have that much incentive to install it selfishly because everyone else is already protecting you from them. 
And if you install it, it just increases the chance that you get quarantined to protect everybody else. I'm saying this for selfish people. I will say I actually do have a standard contact tracing app installed. I hope you all do too. It is good to be altruistic, but somehow we can't bet that the whole world is. But on the other hand, when you look at the Nash equilibrium perspective, with this alternative approach we've come up with, actually, if the whole world except you had this radar installed, and if you installing it would not have to quarantine, because that's not what we're making, but if by installing it, you would get to find out if disease is coming your way very reliably, because everybody else has it already relaying that information, actually most people would find it more compelling to install. So it's actually very interesting. We have a second Nash equilibrium where everybody has it installed selfishly because it's actually designed to protect the user. Now, that is interesting. That, that provides some interesting additional uh, drive for people to maybe want to adopt the app. And if you go and think about it, if there were some terrible disease like Ebola, actually we've done some very informal surveys. And in that hypothetical situation, most people would like to find out if Ebola is coming their way and would be scared and try to be careful if it got close. And that potentially could make a significant impact on the spread of a disease like that. And now let me talk a little bit about the kinds of benefits that this, this alternative approach could have, which is really interesting because it's unlocked by network, just sort of like how LinkedIn is a network too. The first order of magnitude boost is actually that, you see, it turns out that the approach that was done before, uh, it's, it's, well me it's well intentioned and it's good that people were trying to do it, but we have discovered that it's actually quite difficult to make anonymous apps that drive quarantine. Because actually it turns out that if you are around somebody else six feet, 30 minutes, and the other person is sick, then unfortunately the chance, well, fortunately, the chance of transmission is actually quite low, only about 10% or less. Now, granted, that doesn't mean you should run around and be with lots of people, because if you have a bunch of 10%, they add up, and this is only in half an hour. And if you spend a lot of time, it'll add up. But the problem is that if you try to drive a, a signal saying now you should go quarantine where your threshold at which you send out the signal is around 10%, then unfortunately it is difficult to incentivize people even to comply. The, the point that I'm bringing up here is that the approaches that were made before, if you try to do something anonymously and non-enforceably, but the chance of you actually getting sick when the thing tells you is relatively low, then unfortunately this doesn't work very well. And what we decided to do is just to flip the incentive from protect other people to protect yourself. And somehow we found out last year that if people thought that buying enough toilet paper for the next year was a good idea to protect themselves, they would, even though that has virtually no impact. So the key is to flip around that perspective. Uh, and I guess that's what we do as mathematicians. The second thing is that many people point out that one of the issues with all apps like this are that they are based on people voluntarily saying, hmm, I'm sick. And unfortunately, if you're sick, there may be many, many other things you're thinking about other than entering into your app. Well, our approach where we use the network instead and we, we report network distances ends up being interesting because it opens the possibility for another kind of input. Actually, for our system, there are two ways for people to enter signals. One is that I'm sick. And the other is, I'm not sick, but I was around somebody who was sick. Maybe a contact tracer told me. Now, at that point, that's, that's, that's the contact trace context. At that point, this is interesting because it amplifies the amount of signal that we can get into our system. And it's still useful because we are reporting the network distance and there's the triangle inequality in graph theory. What I mean is that if you find out that somebody else who is two physical relationships from you was a direct contact of a sick person, then there was a sick person within two plus one, three relationships of you, physical relationships. It's only a plus minus one error. And suddenly we are able to get inputs both from the, from the positives and from the people that they were around, which could give you a fan out of five or 10 times, which suddenly amplifies your amount of input signal to the point where you could actually find this thing to be useful, even if not everybody, or even if only a few people are entering in their, their status. And that's the power of going to the network. The third thing is that people do point out that unfortunately there's a lot of asymptomatic cases running around, especially after we have vaccinations, for example, uh, but there might also be untested positive cases. And so if you have all of this, how would you be able to protect yourself with a tool like an app? And indeed, that is a problem if the app only tells people when they are directly next to the one who's sick. 
But our concept was, well, once you open the range, if you use long range instead and tell people how far away the disease is, now that's actually not bad. Because even if you're only detecting some small fraction of those cases, if there's a case which is seven relationships from you, as it moves towards you, it's building this giant cloud, cloud of cases. And when there's a giant cloud of cases, someone in that cloud of cases will get tested positive, and then there will be chance for the signal to go in the system. General philosophy is, if you have a weaker vision, if you could have, if you have weaker clarity, it would be better to have longer range, and the longer range makes up for it. Now, a very important detail is anonymity. And that's actually why such a solution like what we're sharing now is something that is possible in today's day and age. Because if you try to come up with a system like this, let's say 20 years ago, it would be very difficult. The only way would be to say, John Smith is sick. Everyone who's around John Smith or around or around or around, be careful. But then John Smith's name is out there. And the beauty of internet and mobile phones is that you can actually try to build a network where you don't use any personal information to label anyone. Because you just put a random user identifier on every smartphone app. You don't need GPS because, I mean, you must, have, you must have read about this. You can use Bluetooth to go and detect how close another phone is based on the signal strength and the inverse square law. And so actually you can do the whole thing just based on relative proximities between random user IDs. And you build a big network on that. For all of the privacy experts in the audience, I will say this is a pseudonymized network. This is not an anonymized network in the sense that there's a stable user identifier. But the bottom line is that the individual person's data that is collected doesn't even include their GPS information, so you can't even look up from there where they live. Privacy experts will point out that it is actually possible when you start combining a bunch of data and using the entire network, yes, then indeed it is actually potentially possible to uncover information about people. And our angle was that we, we understand that is the case, but then we decided that this thing is still providing this is still collecting less information than most of the apps people are using anyway, at which point perhaps what we should try to do is deliver something that has a direct user value, and then there's this privacy trade-off that people will all be making. If I want to protect myself, and in order to do so, you have to give up some amount of information, is that something that you're willing to do? And the key is we have now described it as if you would like to protect yourself, if you would like to derive some benefit. So we flip this into something which has a value proposition for the user which is a different conversation than many of the other approaches that were done before. This is actually all examples. This, this whole framework that I've shown is just an example of using the network collected from this large scale data to deliver some new user experience that could actually help protect people selfishly to avoid the disease. And we've tested this a bit in some, in some experiments. And this is just, a, just showing what happens when this thing is released into the world. Uh, this is a snapshot of what happened at Georgia Tech approximately two weeks after a, a very early version of this was deployed in August of last year. And this, this chart is just showing how if you have a tool like this start to be used, then actually after each user has about two or three connections, a picture like this starts to emerge. This is actually a part of the user interface that we built that shows you how many people at each level of the network there are from you to encourage and incentivize adoption. And the beautiful thing is once the app reaches an R0 of two or three, its own infectiveness of two or three, meaning each person who has the app is close to two or three other people who have the app, then actually this big exponential blow up happens. It only tails off because this was in a university as opposed to in an entire city. But in a dense thing like a university, actually at about 10-20% penetration, you actually will get that every user has about two or three connections, making it so that people see hundreds or thousands of people all connected to them, all using network theory, basically. This is, this is just basically about a network where if you have a graph, a, a network where the average degree is two or three, then the neighborhoods tend to blow up. And that's the math behind this. One interesting thing that is also possible that this is opening up is that you know, unfortunately, we don't know what's going on in the future with COVID or with other diseases. And it would be great if one could do a network analysis, even to find out how variants and vaccines interact. And so what we actually have done is we believe strongly in using the network to try to figure out information. And so we actually have the only system at this point uh, that could be used uh, worldwide, where we actually go and use this network. We're collecting information on it, including things like when people got vaccinated and by which, 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 which uh, brand of vaccine. And this generality of building an entire system on which we could analyze the network of vaccines 
infections and so on is actually the original dream of why I, I started this with our group in the very first place, March of 2020. Because the concept was, if you could actually go and try to use this big data for this kind of good, of, of trying to figure out what's going on with the disease, you might even be able to detect if some new variant starts emerging because of the sudden explosion of infections from a particular point. These are all where we're going. Uh, we, I actually got into this space by accident. I'm actually a math professor. I work on graph theory, network theory. Never expected I'd be in all of this. But it turns out that we have accidentally found this alternative approach where it's all based on just radar. It transforms all kinds of warfare. If you could just find out about threats coming before they get in front of you, that's much more useful than finding out after they have gotten in front of you. And with that, Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to talk interactively during the Q&A period. Thank you.